Hello. My name's Christy Bolingbroke. I'm the Executive Artistic Director for the National Center for Choreography at the University of Akron. And here at NCC Akron, you have joined us for one of our series, Dancing Conversations. Dancing conversations are about bringing dance out into other fields of study, that it's not just something for the studio or the proscenium stage. And here with our Dancing Conversations, we also invite you to join us for this discussion, both as listeners, but also to ask your own questions. So that tonight's event is not one for seeking answers, but the opportunity for you to discover more questions. This evening's event is actually a merging, a moment of intersection for two of our initiatives at NCC Akron. We are also a series editor with the University of Akron Press. And earlier this fall, we published our first ever book, Shifting Cultural Power by Hope Moore. And tonight's discussion is exactly about that between Moore and our guest, Cristina Gonzalez Alcala. And uh, that will be about shifting cultural power. So we hope that you'll be inspired to grab your own copy of the book and that this will add to what the questions may be. Now, I'd also like to acknowledge our co-sponsor for this evening's event, and that is Arts Now as one of our fiercest advocates for arts and culture in and around Summit County. And now to welcome our guests. Hope Moore is a white, queer choreographer, curator, writer, and attorney based in the San Francisco Bay Area on the ancestral lands of the Ramatush Olone people. She co-directs The Bridge Project with Cherie Hill and Carla Quintero. In 2007, she founded HMD to create and support embodied art and social change. In 2010, she founded HMD's core program, The Bridge Project which creates and supports equity-driven live art that builds community and centers artists as agents of change. In 2020, the Bridge Project shifted to an equity-driven model of distributed leadership. And then we also have joining her this evening, Dr. Cristina Gonzalez Alcala is a native of Durango, Mexico, and came to the United States on a golf scholarship. After graduating from the University of Louisville, she came to Akron to be the women's golf graduate assistant coach for the University of Akron's inaugural team. After a year of coaching, she began working as a graduate research assistant at the Institute of Bioscience and Social Research. And during her time at the Institute, she earned a Master of Public Administration, a Master of Arts in Communication, and her doctoral studies in Urban Studies and Public Affairs. In her current role, Christina serves as the Community Investment Officer at Akron Community Foundation. In this role, Christina uses her in-depth knowledge of the nonprofit community to assist Akron Community Foundation's Board of Directors in awarding and evaluating quality grants. In addition to managing the Community Foundation's competitive grant cycles, she also cultivates relationships with local nonprofit leaders and encourages collaboration on community initiatives. Christina is also a senior lecturer at the University of Akron and the co-owner of Mango and the Prickly Cactus, makers of Not Yo Daddy's Mexican Hot Sauce. So this evening, we are bringing the idea of choreography and shifting cultural power at an intersection with the world of philanthropy. Let's tune in and enjoy the discussion. Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Hope Moore. I use she, her pronouns. I am white. I'm able-bodied. Um, I want to first begin by saying that I'm joining the conversation today from the unceded ancestral lands of the Ramatush Ohlone people who were here thousands of years before me and are still here among us. Today we are gathering online and much of our online infrastructure sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. I want to recognize this history and to uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people and territory. I practice land acknowledgement with the knowledge that it is only a beginning, that decolonization is not a metaphor, and that the work must go beyond words and become meaningful through action and relationship. I wanna to begin today by acknowledging that the book Shifting Cultural Power is the result of a network of relationships the book holds the wisdom of many, many artists and activists without whom the book would not have been possible. 
I want to acknowledge these partners and colleagues and thank them for their teachings and partnership. I especially want to acknowledge my co-directors of the Bridge Project, Carla Quintero and Shuri Hill. I also want to thank Christy Bolenbrook for the invitation and the opportunity to write this book, to Michelle Steinwald for writing the foreword, and to the entire team at NCC Akron for supporting the book. Finally, I wanna recognize that for a long, long time, black, indigenous, um, and other people of color, trans and disabled arts workers and organizations have been calling for funding institutions and cultural institutions to be more equitable and more accountable. So these ideas are not new. And lastly, I wanna begin by reading a couple paragraphs from the book that um, allude to how shifting cultural power in the arts intersects with shifting cultural power in philanthropy. So in the book I write on page 29, when white leaders in the arts step back, it creates crucial opportunities for white donors to demonstrate more inclusive cultural philanthropy by investing in leaders of color, not only in historically white led organizations undergoing leadership change, but also in organizations founded by and for people of color. Distributing power in the arts can't happen in a vacuum. As organizational leadership changes, so too does its community and context. When a white-led arts organization evolves into one led or co-led by people of color, the organization must consider how these leadership changes impact its audience and community. The entire arts ecosystem must support these shifts. Funding patterns must prioritize organizations and initiatives led and founded by artists of color. Funding opportunities should be open to organizations and projects working outside the realm of the traditional nonprofit. How can funders give artists direct access to funding opportunities without requiring them to partner with white led organizations or organizations that don't share their values? So just some opening prompts and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Christina. Fantastic, Hope, thank you so much. Uh, thank you also, Christy, uh, for, for having me, for allowing me uh, the opportunity to have this conversation. Um, I want to also offer, uh, well, I would like to introduce myself as Cristina Gonzalez Alcala and uh, share that I am Mexican, uh, which, you know, in uh, the racialized groups here uh, would call me uh, Latina or Hispanic. Uh, I consider myself, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, terms that we use here in the United States, uh, brown, <laughs> and I'm also able-bodied, uh, and I'm here tuning in from Akron, Ohio, from the ancestral lands of the Kaskaskia and Erie Nations, and I also want to honor and acknowledge the first people to occupy this land that today we call Akron. The names they used to identify themselves are largely unknown to us. However, the Native American nations who were stewards of this land before the arrival of the first Europeans included the Seneca and Cayuga from the Iroquois nation, uh, the Huron, the Shawnee, the Ojibwe or Chippewa and the Lenny Lenape who were also called Delaware. I wanna recognize that we owe a debt to these Indian nations who were forcibly removed from the land they sustained for hundreds of years and I uh, hope uh, we can continue to, you know, progress in our um, in our use of, of these lands that that were given to us, and that we may honor um, everybody's uh, lives here. So, I also want to thank uh, my my current job, where I'm at at Akron Community Foundation. Uh, you know, Hope and you sharing your your excerpt from the book. I, I realized that that shift has uh, slightly happened by me being provided this space as community investment officer, uh, again, as a Latina, as a Mexican. Um, uh, it's been interesting to be in a white led organization. Uh, and it's been also rewarding to uh, see that those in power have started the conversations uh, to get us to a place where there, we can achieve some of that balance and, and power. And, you know, this position definitely is uh, an example of that. And I always just wish to provide uh, my whole self to it as authentically as possibly and as I can. And uh, thank the foundation for receiving me in, in that regard, right? Receiving my skills, receiving my authenticity uh, and allowing me to do some of the work here um, through the foundation. So with that, I think we're, we're gonna get rolling. Uh, hope, 
So you, you obviously, you know, you, you shared a little bit already about what you wrote the book, but I just have to ask you, right? You have to tell us again in your words a little bit what it is, what this book had meant to you, why you write this book. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, the book, the idea for the book actually came um, at the invitation of Christy Bolingbrook. Christy approached me, um, I guess, in late 2018. Um, and asked if I might be interested in writing a book to um, mark the 10th anniversary of the Bridge Project. Um, Christy and I had worked together um, in San Francisco, and so she was familiar with the program. Um, so it began as um, almost an, an exercise in, in archive. You know, what does it mean to archive a public program? Um, but as um, I embarked on the process of writing the book, it became a lot more, and it became clear to me that it was important that I use my privilege and position as a, as a white person in the field um, to advocate for change, to advocate for equity-driven models. Um, and as I say in the book, I feel like it's really important for um, white people to talk to other white people um, about shifting power, um, expecting people of color to do that educational labor um, is an example of white privilege. And I feel like that's been happening for too long. Um, so I feel like for white people uh, to drive change, we have to use our positions of power to um, self-educate and then of course to act. Um, so uh, I wanted to use the book as a series of case studies in the opportunities um, that arise in the field when we decenter whiteness and what it looks like, um, kind of the messy, the messy journey of shifting power. I wanted to offer kind of an inside look um, and a personal look on, on what one example of, of that journey looks like. Um, so Christina, I wanted to um, ask you a question. Um, you know, I wrote this book as a white person committed to shifting power, um, and I'd love to hear your perspective on shifting power in philanthropy as, as a Latinx person in, as you said, white dominated spaces. Um, I read recently that only 22% of foundation staff in the US are people of color. So I'm, I'd love to hear from you about how you push institutional change from the inside. Um, yeah. Absolutely, thanks Hope. So it's, um, uh, I, I, again, I'm, I'm always thankful to, to be in this space. I don't, I don't take it lightly for sure. And, um, I think again, part of me being here is, uh, one step, you know, closer, uh, for us, uh, to, to achieving some of that change. And I think the leadership here recognizes that some of the things that we've, you know, we've been working along, I actually came to, to the foundation and there was already work that had been done. Uh, there was already, uh, conversations that had happened, you know, on the table conversations, there had already been results that had been collected. And, you know, the idea that we needed to focus our attention and our um, resources to issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And that comes, you know, from around 20, 2017, 2018. So I had a little bit of, uh, of a roadmap when I got here. Um, and of course, I got here in 2019. <laughs> uh, I got through two funding cycles, and and then we were hit with the pandemic as well with uh, the murder of, of George Floyd. Uh, and as every every other organization in the nation, we would call for that racial reckoning. And in doing so, we um, I, I I was asked to ask uh, to write a, a thought piece based on conversations we had internally with our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, as well as with the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee from the staff as well as board, right? Which again, thankfully, those were already in place uh, before these conversations had happened. And so we, I wrote a thought piece that um, turned out to be quite cathartic. Uh, again, because as you mentioned, I, I was, I am a Latinx or a Latina funder in a white dominated space uh, and predominantly uh, white serving. I mean, though we acknowledge that, you know, Summit County is a little bit more white. Akron does tend to have a high African-American black population. And in, in writing that uh, that piece, uh, what I what I saw and what my place was uh, as as it was developing, is being that person that allow um, that brings information to um, people in power, right? Not necessarily speaking truth to power. I, I think because it has to come in in a way that uh, we all collaborate with it. Um, 
I have to understand, you know, my, my place in, in, in the world as well, being that I, I come here um, uh, under, you know, and their history, I come here under certain resources, and it's my job to then make sure that we get to the conversations, get to the place where we're having the conversations. Uh, so part of it is just, you know, introducing some of the terms, introducing some of the work. Uh, I started, you know, grabbing information from uh, online. There was luckily lots of resources coming up, all virtual, of course. Uh, so it made it easy for us to consume some of those things that otherwise we would have to like engage in, in additional resources being spent on us to then, you know, take away from the resources that we need to spend on people to, to better serve and to, you know, uh, achieve that equilibrium. So I think part of, of what, I've, what I've done here is to just try to, trying to be a, a mediator of sorts, right? I mean, I, I find myself in that space where, yes, I am a person of color, but for some, you know, and it's been told <laughs> now a couple of times I've been uh, the recipient of that, that I am white passing, right? And I and I acknowledge that. Of course, not once I start talking, not so much anymore because the accent comes through. Uh, and sometimes I'm like, well, the curly hair didn't give it away. But uh, anyways, in that white passing, it seems that uh, with people's biases, right, they're more... Uh, in in tune to when I speak to to listen to when I speak and so I also again don't take that lightly and I want to honor that trust and that uh, openness and them to collaborate with me to not just come and say hey this is what we got to do but instead learn where are they at and where do we need to be and then how do I coach a little bit or how do I help bring resources so we can get to where we need to be that's great thank you and, and, you know, I mean, so this this goes back to then our, our next question, which is, uh, you know, writing about artivism. Uh, it, and it, you talked a lot more about how it it meant to to focus on the process, right, versus the product, which is kind of where I saw all of this going. Like, we need, we can't just tell somebody, hey, this is what we need to do and expect that the product happens, right, which we, I see those in conversations. It was speaking to me in reading uh, in your book about artivism, and I, I wanted you to share more about that process, right? What what it looks like to to focus on the process, and uh, w even what artivism actually means, also, please. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I use the term artivism in the book um, to refer to cultural work as an ethical commitment and a tool for social change. Um, I'm reading from the book. That's why my eyes are going over here. Gotcha. Um, but folks might be um, familiar with other terms that refer to the same kind of work. Um, terms synonymous with artivism include art for change, public practice, socially engaged art, and social practice. Um, and I also write, artivism is often more about process than product. It is collaborative and participatory the products of artivism often hold equal or less importance to the collaborative act of creating them. Um, and I also, I go on to say that artists from historically marginalized communities often have no choice but to intertwine politics with their art. In contrast, um, often white folks um, feel like politics and to be politically engaged is, is optional. Um, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was to really challenge that assumption um, among white artists that making political uh, work is, is optional. And I also wanted to um, challenge the kind of whiteness as neutral um, fallacy that white folks, when they make art, it's, it's neutral and apolitical, when in fact, um, every art that everyone makes is, is political in some way. So. Um, I wanted to challenge the assumption that arts and politics are an either or thing, that it's a zero sum game, that you're either making art or you're engaged in politics. Um, and I feel like part of the work of shifting uh, cultural power is, is changing the way we talk about um, arts and politics. So um, for me, this gets to the question of how we define success or even that very loaded term excellence in the arts, um, how we define success. And because artivism um, and, and socially engaged art is so process oriented, for me, it raises the question of um, how can we shift our definitions of success, both in the arts and in philanthropy? So I'd love to hear from you as a community investments officer, 
um, if we're prioritizing equity, how do you think we, or how do, how do you define success in community investments? Yeah, I mean, that's, it, it's speaking to really the, the work that I'm engaging right now in, in terms of shifting my own mind. Uh, before I got here, I was at a uh, education backbone organization, right? Uh, and as uh, Christy had introduced me, I, I also was working at an Institute for Bioscience and Social Research doing program evaluation. And program evaluation in and of itself is like, what did we achieve, right, in the end? What was the product? And I, I, there was never really a conversation about what was what, what happened. How do we really change? I mean, in the end, it was it was um, the post mortem, right? Now we're doing the autopsy after we got the results. Never really was it about how do we explore what's happening within the process, rather than than caring so much about the end. And when I got here to the foundation, uh, and I had a you know great conversation with uh, our executive director John Paturis, uh, as you know, he pushed me to, you know, to say, you know, you're here, we, we want you to bring that with you that, you know, how do we achieve those results? And I said, you know what, what I love about the community foundation, I community foundation is that you always have had latitude in terms of your funding, right? You have always allowed a nonprofit to, you know, either shift in their, in their processes to go from one uh, program to another program to just receive operating support because you believe in the organization itself and its mission. And in my observation from working with those organizations that were being funded by the foundation, it was way more relaxed to go for, for a grant for um, Akron Community Foundation in terms of you know how do we measure success? Because and now that I'm here, to me a success is is how did you define success yourself, right? For an organization that is mentoring students, is success really just about helping them learn how to read? Or did you actually answer a phone call at like 10 o'clock at night because you were the only person that that student could reach at that time? And did you save a student's life, right? When I come to these uh, side visits like, and they share these stories, to me, that's <laughs> that's the, the the pulp of it all, right? And that's the, the part of the work that I'm also trying to do with them. With how do I better tell your story? Because that story of success does not necessarily equate a product of sorts, does not necessarily equate to, you know, uh, 30 more thousand people engaged with, with this uh, uh, dance uh, production, right? 65% uh, of our children were, were uh, achieving, you know, reading success. No, it's like, no, like, what? What did you do in that process, right? That's why activism sort of like just called me and in, in reading those passages from your book, I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm a little bit of an activist, right? <laughs> because I am trying to shift that, that narrative of let's focus on the process, right? And the racial equity impact assessment that we're conducting right now, it, it has the hope for me that the, the organizations that we interact with through our, our funding grants, that they tell us, listen, it's, this is how we need to communicate success to you while also then again you know and that little bit of a mediator talk to my committee my community investment committee members and say what what does it matter to you when you're reading an application what matters right so that we can then figure out a way to do that efficiently but then you know in the in that efficiency in, in learning what one, one, what one wants to tell, what one wants to hear, right? Then I can kind of lay out the ground for that equity of it. Because then I can then take what um, the investors, you know, the community investment committee needs and share that with the nonprofit leaders, which honestly, some of the best feedback that I've received so far that nonprofits coming to me, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to remove that power dynamic. <laughs> I mean, I know it's there and it's never going to leave, right? Once I got here and I got that foundation lady next to me, like it, it changed our, our interactions a little bit, but I try to keep it as low key as possible with them. And I've seen a much greater number of uh, African-American black organizations applying to us because now they can call me and now I can be like, listen, this is what I need you to do. This is what we need to focus on. This is how, you know, we uh, get your, your story through in a way that the committee can better understand it based on what our priorities are, what the community has said, 
So I, I really, you know, I guess, believe it or not, have been focusing on the process. And I just didn't know that, right? I really stepped away and said, okay, I, I don't care, especially when the pandemic hit. It's like, you cannot be telling me right now that we're going to judge nonprofits on how many kids attended school or how many kids logged in. No, tell me how many kids you actually interacted with and what were those interactions about. And once you tell me about those, tell me because no, but I cannot be with those students at all times. And I cannot, and if you tell me, then I can tell those people that have the decision making power what it is that our community actually needs, right? Because there's also then research, what is getting through? I mean, you, I don't know, I know I don't have to tell you, but what gets through is, is not always equitable, right? In terms of academic writing. And, and so for me, I need those stories, right? I need that process. Mm. And, and that's some of the, the, the stuff that we've, we've been doing here, um, which, you know, when, when I think about it, then that makes me question, you know, when, when I was reading of all the work that you've done, everybody that you read, everybody that you interacted with, it's like, were they experiencing some sort of, you know, similar uh, process to, to mine, right? I mean, not to say pro process fo focused on process, but wh what was the work that they were doing, you know, that made them achieve that expertness or that success uh, story when when you were talking to them you know I'm curious if you saw if, if you if there was anything that sparked your mind and said you know what they, they all share this right or these are some of the techniques or or some of the strategies they used in order to achieve that that change mm. um gosh I mean I I uh, the book uh, talks about a, a lot of different artists. Um, I think the Bridge Project's engaged um, over over 100 artists over the past 10 years, and everyone's super different and has, um, you know, different art practices and different uh, different communities that they're engaged in and rooted in. And um, so it's hard to generalize. But, um, you know, when you ask if there were common threads, and I think when I was writing the book, I was looking for um, themes and, and through lines. Um, and definitely um, in, in all of the relationships that I've had with artists, um, it was clear to me that um, the message that historically white-led organizations in the arts need to change, that was a clear, a clear through line and that white folks need to move back and share power and give away power. Those were um, kind of consistent themes and, and messages that I was hearing from artists. Um, also that like an, a diversity approach has not worked in terms of um, equitable outcomes. That's also really clear um, that we need to shift to an equity mindset as opposed to a diversity mindset. Um, that was uh, definitely clear. And also the real need in the arts um, for us to shift away from a kind of singular standard of um, artistic value. That was a real um, clear message that we need to shift away from evaluating art using only um, Western European aesthetic values. Um, so those were some of the kind of takeaway messages that I um, have, have found in, in my partnerships with artists. Um, and I think also you asked, you know, in, in some of our planning conversations for this conversation, you were curious about tools for resilience that I've seen um, that artists of color have, have been yeah. using. And I feel like um, something that's been a big, a big learning curve for me is the importance of um, supporting affinity spaces for artists yeah. of color. So, um, spaces of, of sanctuary um, where artists can um, refuse the white gaze where, uh, you know, BIPOC only spaces and, um, you know, the importance of, of supporting artists in creating and, and holding those spaces. I think sometimes um, there's pushback from white people and white institutions about the uh, importance of affinity spaces for artists of color but I feel like some of the work that white people um, need to be doing in the arts is um, recognizing and honoring affinity spaces as, um, as a really important tool um, in advancing racial justice and as, as a response to historical legacies of oppression. 
Um, so that's that's one kind of tool I've seen as being um, useful and, and successful in supporting artists of color um, resilience. I mean, you know, to the, the, I, I was recently at a, at a room full of, of Latinos and Latinas and the vibe is just so much different. And, you know, as much as I feel like I'm here authentically, like there's just like, you know, I, I still code switch, right? I still have to put in that other persona that is, you know, acceptable at work. And I mean, we were moving tables. And like, <laughs> we're at like the, the rocket mortgage field house. We're moving the tables. We're like just dancing. We're like, it, and it just vibes so differently. People asking each other, like, have you met, you know, you, how do you know them? I'm like, I just met them, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and it is, it is, uh, I, I can see how that is very important, you know, and I'm glad that here, uh, at least uh, in Akron, we've, not, I'm not saying we we already knew about that <laughs> by by any means, right? But I am glad to see that uh, you know through arts now collaborative and and um, artists themselves that we have here the Akron uh, Black Artists Guild and uh, same thing happened, right? I, I was I, I was there and it hits different right? when when you're able to produce from from the space of you know what it would actually feel like to produce for somebody like you and for you. Uh, and, and, and I see it. Um, it, it yeah, it, it, it is a, it is a powerful thing. So I appreciate that, that you bring that up as something that, that needs to be taken into account. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about your tools in advancing equity in philanthropy. I feel like um, shifting cultural power in the arts um, requires a lot of different approaches um, that are context dependent. I mean, sometimes you have to do things that are focused on reducing harm. Sometimes you have to evolve or shift an existing organization. Sometimes the best thing to do is to dismantle um, an existing structure altogether. So I was curious um, in your work as a community investment officer, um, what are your tools and practices for advancing equity? I think the, the the one of the main tools we employed here is the the tool for convening, right? We can convene, and we have been able to hold the spaces for the conversations, uh, those crucial conversations that that need to happen, that uh, feel awkward still, and even uh, you know not not authentic, but at the same time when they're happening, you know, it's like it's like going to the gym and working out. <laughs> Like you got to go and work out in order to see results. You can't just up and wake up and all of a sudden you have a six pack. Like you, you actually got to put in some work. And so for us, it's been uh, having those conversations. It's um, the ability to reach those, you know, historically in power. While also then from, you know, my perspective, me reaching those uh, who power needs to be transferred to, right? Who are historically disenfranchised, oppressed and persecuted. And, uh, you know, in, in, in that regard, using the conversation as a tool holding space for others to have those conversations, I think has been how we, you know, slowly are engaging in that in that work of, of harm reduction, uh, of maybe transformation. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say we're there yet at dismantling, right? But we're, we're there where we're trying to, again to, where we're working, we're putting in the work so that we can get there. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, one important tool uh, that gets overlooked, again, because we're so focused on producing, is listening. <laughs> like, if you can, I, and I'm, I'm getting goosebumps right now, but, and even though, you know, I don't claim to be a great listener, but even just, just pausing for myself, right? And where it says also in the book is like, make, ask the questions without expecting the answer, right? I just have had moments where I just let a nonprofit leader talk and I kid you not, uh, one more recent one, I mean, the, the, the nonprofit leader, which I, I hold in high esteem, actually, you know, shared some tears. Uh, there was frustrations. Uh, there was a lot going on for them. Uh, and I'm like, listen, I, I'm, I'm really here to help, right? I might not be able to help entirely with a, you know, $50,000 grant. But I think that as, uh, again, you know, that humanistic approach, I'm just here to listen and let's figure out how to collaborate beyond just money, 
there is tools other than money, right? That money be one of the things that, you know, one of the medicines, as uh, Edgar Villanueva calls it, one of the medicines that we employ, but there's more than that, right, to healing. And, and I think listening and being that, um, that funder that is welcoming to uh, nonprofit leaders expressing challenges as well as successes has really helped uh, in, you know, getting to, to some of that uh, equity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I talk in the book about the importance of difficult conversations. And I feel like just, just the willingness to have a difficult conversation and to invite those difficult conversations, I think so much of the work is just in that, in that practice. For sure. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're nearing we're nearing our, our term here together, which is sad because we can keep on talking. Did you um, want to touch on 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 our work with uh, the, the mediators as arts now? I guess you you'd call them. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, something that you and I had talked about wanting to talk about is the the gatekeeper dynamic, um, where. Uh, you know, foundations give funding not directly to communities, but um, through intermediary uh, nonprofit organizations. Um, at least in the arts, this is a big topic of conversation um, because in these regranting relationships, um, often um, the the recipient nonprofit organization um, doesn't bring the artist to the table at any point in the process. Um, the grantee organization retains control over the money and the relationship with the funder. Um, often the artists never see the grant proposal, they never see the budget, they never know what percentage of the grant is going to them. So I was just curious to hear your thoughts on this dynamic and how it shows up in your work and um, any thoughts you have about how foundations can give money directly, directly to communities. Right. So one of the things that keeps us from, you know, directly providing to artists is that, right, we cannot fund individuals directly. Uh, but we have worked with Arts Now, our backbone organization for arts and culture in Summit County, to reach those artists. Uh, it's particularly during the pandemic, uh, right, uh, JR Foundation had uh, started a fund uh, that was given to Arts Now so Arts Now could help us reach the artists and then Aqua Community Foundation, we pitched in for that one as well. Uh, you know, for, for us, when we talked to Nicole Mollet, it's like, you know, Nicole, for us, of course, you know, understand that uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is uh, very important. So if uh, you have to, you know, provide some kind of um, grading, right? I mean, make sure that our money is reaching those uh, those communities of color, right? Artists of, of color. Um, and again, disenfranchised artists. Uh, and so it took a lot of work for her because she, she read through the whole thing. And again, if you talk to her, I mean, she was overwhelmed as well because it's like, how do I say no to this person but say yes to this person? It's it's not easy. You know, the, we don't have uh, infinite resources, unfortunately. So we do have to make some kind of, you know, uh, abstract calls, right? That, you know, today I'm, I'm going to give here and I'm going to give there maybe because this needs sounding more pertinent right now or what have you. Um, but I think for us, it's important to have arts now still, uh, and, and especially as it came to um, the, the work uh, commission for them, which was to create the uh, cultural plan, the Akron cultural plan, the artists were involved, the community was involved. Again, uh, I, as I realized, you know, and you talking about artivism and the, the focus on the process, so much was about how that process needed to be done right. Right, and we centered equity in that process. We wrote an equity statement, and that equity statement, the the process. And now that I realize it and play back, the process was what mattered. The product happened to be great, <laughs> but the product was only great because we had uh, a white cisgender man uh, in uh, you know in, in power, as well as uh, a, a black uh, African American woman. Uh, cisgender also, and my, myself, cisgender also, Mexican. So we kind of have like a nice little kaleidoscope of, of diversity there. Uh, but for both uh, Bronlin and myself, Bronlin, uh, the, the other woman, African-American woman, and myself, seeing the white man, <laughs> Doug, just kind of like step, take that step back that you're talking about, right? 
and allowing us to drive some of the conversation, allowing us to express freely, like just completely made magic at that point, right? I mean, things just flow naturally and help. And and so the fact that the cultural plan employed that, employed asking thousands of people, including artists and whatnot, like we we saw the value in that and we continue to see the value in it, which is why we support arts now. Um, you know, we, we do see that gatekeeping of sorts sometimes because now as we um, uh, center racial equity in our work and in our funding for arts and culture, we are pushing the aquaculture plan as something that artists should be aware of, not something that you necessarily need to like, um, you know, match, right? There's certain priorities and not all your work has to match the priorities different from how we do in education perhaps, but you need to be aware of it just because it, it provides, it, it, has, it was already work that took process that was people centered, right? And the people spoke. And so the people were the ones that provided the priority, not us as funders. So also as a funder, that cultural uh, plan became a tool for me, right? A tool for me to then <clears throat> say, this is how we can better distribute the money. This is some of the things that the community said needed. So let's, uh, let's figure out a way to work with arts now, while also understanding that, you know, we need to figure out, uh, ways for for arts now to stay connected to each of the artists which they do fortunate to us i mean i don't know if that exists anywhere else but fortunate to us you know the work that nicomo it is she goes she knows these artists directly i can say hey do you know so and so yes can i have their phone number yes and those conversations happen where actually the akron black artist guild held uh like a little um what's it called like a rock uh, speed dating with with funders, right? And and so they actually did meet with us. We actually did get to meet each other. And from those things, we're we're, we're having projects that are gonna come up. Um, that you know, if I didn't have arts now either, then I don't know how I could meet with all of them. You know, <laughs> so so easily as well. Yeah, I think we're at time, but it's great to hear from you how um, working partnering with intermediary organizations definitely has benefits and. Um, is a crucial is a crucial tool, um, but I think we're going to go to Christy. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you so much, Hope and Christina, for such an enriching conversation and a frank dialogue. Thank you for raising your questions to this topic, certainly. And uh, as a research and development space at NCC Akron, we hope that this conversation and the book Shifting Cultural Power will serve as tools for you in your own learning journey in this moment for us as a country, as a sector and a field, and also here in Akron when trying to tackle and look for your own relevance and forward movement. Considering the Akron Cultural Plan's top public priority is equity. In addition to thanking Hope and Christina, I also wish to thank our co-sponsor, Arts Now, and Nicole Mullet with her team. And we also hope that you will check out the Akron Cultural Plan at akronculturalplan.com. And then I would be remiss if not to also acknowledge that public programs and events like these would not be made possible without the critical support from organizations like the GAR Foundation, the Akron Community Foundation, and the Ohio Arts Council. And of course, the establishment and general operation of NCC Akron is made possible by the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. Next steps, I hope that you will continue to purchase the book at nccakron.org slash books. If you use the discount code NCCAKRON30, you can get 30% off for your copy or perhaps copies for your entire team. And then you can also continue to follow Hope's work at hopemore.org. That's H-O-P-E-M-O-H-R dot O-R-G. And then also the Bridge Project at bridgeproject.art. You want to follow up our friends at the Akron Community Foundation. That's akroncf.org. And once again, to follow up with the Akron Cultural Plan and check it out for yourself, you can go to akronculturalplan.com. I'm Christy Bolingbroke. Thanks you again for tuning in. And until next time, see you then. <laughs>